Well, it's been a big week for rocket launches. For the first time, three different companies launched within 24 hours. For more, I'm now joined by astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Now, firstly, there's a bit of an Aussie link to New Zealand's Rocket Lab launch. What is it? Take us through it. Yeah, so Rocket Labs, uh, we saw the successful launch um, a little while ago. Uh, now, the trick with this was this is actually one of the rocket launches that was impacted by coronavirus. It was scheduled for late April, but now that New Zealand reopened their activity, we were able to see it. And one of the satellites it was carrying was one built and designed here in Canberra. It was the M2 Pathfinder satellite. Now, this was built and designed by UNSW Canberra. Uh, it was tested up at where I work, Mount Sherman Observatory at the ANU. And the data, the ground station is completely done by a private company just north of Canberra, Siegel in space called NYAS. And so this is kind of remarkable because what we've seen is a fairly cheap, really quickly built in a, in a good way, designed, operated satellite from an Australian city. And as we were talking about, you know, a couple of months ago about, you know, how the world was locking down and how it was affecting space, these sorts of things where we can do these things solely in-house is very, very important. And now that satellite is in space and it's been successfully deployed and launched or, and operated. And SpaceX and Interstellar Technologies also launched this week. We're talking three different companies in 24 hours. Is that a significant milestone, would you say? Yeah, a big milestone. I mean, firstly, I don't even think we've seen three rocket launches in 24 hours, you know, ever. But this, as you said, was all private companies. It just shows how far space is evolving. So, you know, it's also three continents, right? We had New Zealand with a private company in Rocket Labs. We had SpaceX in the US. And then, as you said, interstellar technologies in Japan. Uh, and so this really shows how space is becoming cheaper and more effective. And all the rockets were doing different purposes and different sizes. You know, Rocket Labs was a bit smaller. They're only carrying small satellites, SpaceX, Falcon 9 was a bit bigger. You know, just like airplane travel, we need the big 747s to go the long haul flights. We need the smaller commuter planes for quicker, shorter flights. And this is what we're seeing with space is really taking a, a big leap forward. And this period has marked that change in space accessibility. Now, speaking of SpaceX, it's Starlink. He's asking people to try and test their satellite network. What sort of a speed can we expect? How would it work? So, yeah, so this is pretty remarkable. So, you know, they now have 540 satellites up there and they're asking people now you have to be in the far northern part of the world. So unfortunately, we're way too far <laughs> south. Um, but they hope that in Australia and globally, it will roll out in 2021 and they're expecting speeds of a gigabyte per second. Now, to put that in the scale, most NBN customers are probably on 10 megabits per second. The max plan is 100 megabits per second. So we're talking 10 to 100 times faster than what we're getting in Australia. And it's global, right? You can connect anywhere in Australia and anywhere around the world. So it's showing just the promise of this technology, especially for a continent like Australia. Uh, just, I mean, this sounds like it would be very advanced technology. Can you give us a bit of an insight into, into how it's put together? That's right. So, you know, it is advanced because one of the always limitations of satellites has been satellites need to go around the Earth every 90 to 100 minutes. So as that satellite moves, you get gaps in satellite coverage. But by having these networks and these hundreds of satellites all moving around, it's kind of like mobile phone towers, right? You're driving and you're connected to one tower and then all of a sudden you transfer to another tower, what we call a handshake. That's going to happen with satellites. So no matter where the satellites are moving in this case, you will always have this receiver. And the receiver will be less like a, an antenna, but more as they're calling it. It's like a UFO, they're quoted, like this little disc that will attach to the front of your house. And so instead of a cable you have to plug in, this receives the data from the satellite and you hook up a, a router or whatever you want. And you have very, very high speed reliable internet and it's going to be cheaper than the infrastructure and what we can get on the NBN. So it's a remarkable piece of technology that we're now going to next year in Australia see the benefits of. Amazing. Well, it certainly shows how far technology has come. Now, Brad, there may be 36 intelligent civilizations in the Milky Way right now. How is this possible? So this is interesting. So it's, it's a new calculation. And look, this is an estimate. Uh, but what it's trying to say is really how many Earth-like civilizations and specifically how many civilizations where life has evolved and like human time spans and technology has? Because the question is, 
We know of lots of stars. There's 300 billion stars in our Milky Way. We know there's lots of planets. There's probably 20 billion planets like Earth. What about the life? Is there anything out there that we could potentially communicate? So this new study kind of crunched the numbers of what we know and then kind of applied a model of what would we look like if it was like Earth and humans and that sort of thing. And so they got an answer of 36. Now, it's a very specific answer, and so that's not necessarily the right answer. Um, but they got anywhere between zero and, and 920, essentially. And what it shows is that there could be quite a lot of civilizations out there right now in our Milky Way. The problem, obviously, is space is big, and it would take thousands of years for those communication signals to reach us here on Earth or vice versa. So even though they may exist, we may never contact them. Oh, well, maybe, but hopefully maybe one day, one day, one one day. day we might, right. fingers crossed. Now, here's one that we could all potentially partake in. On, on tomorrow night, tomorrow evening, we're being invited to take part in a world record attempt looking and measuring light pollution. What exactly does this entail? That's right. So starting tomorrow afternoon, uh, so anyone in Australia can do this. We're trying to set the world record for the most people doing an online environmental lesson. And that lesson is about light pollution. And light pollution simply is all those lights that we have around here on Earth, our houses, and that lights up the skies. And it starts to reduce our visibility. And so it affects things like animal migration. It affects our sleep cycles. And it also affects our ability to see in space. And so what we're asking people to do is to learn a little bit about it and at the same time, do your own measurement. And to do this, you simply just need to go outside and look at the Southern Cross and just tell us what you see. How many stars do you see? How clearly is the Southern Cross? Do you see the fifth star of the Southern Cross? Do you see more or less? And by having all these sorts of people all around Australia saying what we see, we can really gauge the impacts of light pollution because there's a lot of the world because of the lights of the city that have never even seen our own Milky Way. Places in Singapore and the US, there's about 2 billion people who have never seen our own galaxy. And with the dark skies we have in Australia, it's a great way of talking about simple energy conservation and appreciation for above. Well, if people want to give it a go, partake in a world record attempt, definitely check it out online. Brad Tucker, pleasure to speak with you as always. Thank you for joining me.